transcript. There we go. Uh, this is, what was that? This is the sense doing call, probably soon to be renamed for Monday, April 10th, 2023. Um, and I have no idea who's going to show up uh, or what's what's up here. So shall we catch up with uh, where we are? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Should we wait a, a minute or two or? Um, we don't have to. Yeah. Pardon? We don't have to. Well, I figure we can catch up and then with whoever steps in, we yeah. can catch them up to our catching up. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, so Klaus, Pete and I sat down and looked at um, this project and arranged some, a couple of sort of pages and folders for where to put things and talked about a few strategic things and came up with, um, did we do an agenda? We did an agenda, didn't we? Uh, yeah. I thought we did. I will um, find it. I don't know. <clears throat> um, uh, well, and I tried to sort of make more sense out of our pages, and <clears throat> my brain was not engaging properly. So I didn't I didn't manage to sort of rationalize uh, what we started putting up. But uh, the idea, Klaus, is uh, the simplest idea is, hey, let's write a book, which is an edited volume, which means uh, a collection of a couple chapters uh, written by different contributors, which together feel like a book. Uh, and the simplest thing that could possibly work might be, uh, an edited volume with three contributions and uh, in introductory material, uh, end, end matter, uh, a cover art, and then publish that as an ebook, as to you know, publish that to EPUB or something like that. Um, and then that is a goal. Like like a, a really simple uh, book is is a starting point and will give us a, a small victory. I think a large victory actually, considering the kinds of things we've done for three years in in OGM. Um, and then uh, I was sort of layering on top of that, the idea of uh, neo books or a series of books that share nuggets uh, that have different people's propositions. <clears throat> so there might be, uh, there might be a book Klaus that you want to champion that is about um, uh, regenerative agriculture and water management and a couple other things. And whatever the structure of chapters are and whoever else you want to sort of recruit into creating that body of work, uh, however that works out. But the idea of the regenerative economy might be a reusable module uh, for several other uh, books who are interested in other, other aspects of regeneration, for example. Um, so that's just a really simple way of thinking about it. And then we're thinking of using massive wiki style architecture as the underpinnings for the whole thing. Stacey, yay. Um, we're thinking of using massive wiki sort of uh, doc massive wiki is basically markdown documents uh, currently massive wiki is markdown documents on a github shared volumes um, ha happy uh, Passover and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. I think it's really interesting that Ramadan Passover and Easter all overlapped yesterday <clears throat> and I guess today um, and so we have set up the beginnings, the rudiments of the beginnings of how that document sharing might work. <clears throat> We've also set up a page that has some roles that we think people could play. Um, and we're in the roles page, for example, and Stacy was here last week when we were talking about some of this, um, we started using the language of book publishing. So there might be editors and there might be you know, volumes published and so forth and reviewers or, or whatnot. Um, but that language might not be the language we wanna end up with. And part of what we need to talk through is, is what do we want to call this and how might it work? Um, Doug Carmichael has his book, Garden World Politics, already written and published. You can go buy it on Amazon, but it might be very interesting to deconstruct his book and uh, put it you know, into the medium we're talking about here and see what else might be woven through it or how that might change the book or what else might happen. And then one last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop. Um, the book artifact is meant to be a shiny object that is an attractor to other people in the world because people in Western culture and around the world know what books are and books are supposed to be where wisdom lives. But the book is really a gateway drug to participating in discussions and uh, sense making that's happening live online 
And uh, so, and therefore the book artifacts should be connected in to resources, conversations, other sorts of things uh, and how that works. We haven't fully determined, but we're, I think we're sort of on board that, that it's, we, we're calling this a book project and a book writing project, <clears throat> but the book is, is the beginning of it, not the end of it uh, in that sense. Questions, anything to add? Well, we're done then. I love how quickly this goes. Um, and I, I think a thing, to, one thing we, one thing in, in front of us right now is like just naming and, and figuring out what to call the project because it has a couple different names and none of which are, are sort of are, are sort of fixed yet. Uh, but then another uh, important task is, hey, who's interested in uh, co-authoring or even authoring a book, a book-like object? And uh, then we need to organize those uh, teams into uh, places and into some kind of work rhythm where what they create is consistent with other sorts of teams writing books in this under this general umbrella uh, and how that works out. But that doesn't seem that seems like fun. And, you know, if we're into things um, and, and Klaus, I think a lot of materials that you've probably generated are, are book book happy materials. Uh, we could, in fact, <clears throat> one way to start would be to take a presentation <clears throat> and then uh, either take a transcript of the, the speech over the presentation or talk through the presentation to figure out where the edges of nuggets or modules are, uh, break them down and put them into a shared volume someplace and see what that what that leads to. Uh, I think there's lots of, lots, lots of different ways of going about this. Um, and I guess important for starting is to pick something simple, to just pick something that that is is relatively evident and fun and quick to do. Because I stop me if I'm wrong, but I think that doing something quickly, simply that looks like the end product we're looking for would be inspirational and useful and good. Yes, Stacy. So first, I just want to say that. Um... I'm coming on this call a little late because I'm right now struggling with knowing that I have to put my dog to sleep tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, just to give you some background. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, based on last week that there's a group of people that are particularly interested in language. So even when we talk about what we're gonna call this, you know, I had thrown out the word channels and it was interesting because Jerry even mentioned the first time he heard it, he thought of TV channels and that was like a no-go for him. And I was saying, well, channels brings us back to focusing on water. And I actually liked the fact that Jerry thought of TV channels because for some people that that's a draw. So for me, that was a word that, I, I thought that was a good word to use. The point I'm trying to make is, some people would find this kind of a conversation very picky in. And other people are really drawn to this conversation. So when you mention a call that could be fun and, you know, that might be a separate call because, like I said, some people would be bored out of their minds or like, why are these people focused on this? And let's get to the point. And that's reasonable, too. And other people, and I think there should be a, a place on the editorial board for, for this particular function feel that the language used is just as important as some of the other things. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Makes sense. And if I go offline, I'm listening. I just Yeah, I'm so sorry. Thank I, you. I um I still remember a little too vividly um having to um let go of my cat smidgen um back around 2008, I think. And her mom outplaced her with me when when she was a kitten and I lived in Westport, Connecticut. It was totally an outplacement. Her mom checked me out and like this guy'll do. And then she trained Smidge to hunt, weaned her and left. Never saw mom cat again. And Smidge was mine for 16 years. So well, I have one child that's very supportive and has come to, and one child that is not child. <laughs> 31 is not a child, but really putting more of a toll on me than I need because mm. I know I'm acting for my dog and not for me. So. I'm sorry. Thanks. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. 
Well, <clears throat> what what attracted me to this conversation, and I listened in to uh, to the conversation from from last week. I mean, you, you know, you have been watching me bouncing all over the place with uh, climate change and uh, as it is connected to the food and agriculture sector and how how crazy that all is really and, and how fully understood by the general public. Yeah. And so um, my, my observation is that there is a huge gap between practitioners, you know, people who are working in the field and <clears throat> the... Uh, what you, what what do you want to call it? Maybe the public mindset, you know, the the awareness and and where um, what people know and understand about it. Um, and so, Garden World, for example, you know, that did you know, a really good outline as to what the future should look like or could look like if um, uh, if we put our mind to it and and. Uh, uh, now got our survival instincts up and running and and actually um embraced you know that we are that we are really at a, on a cliff you now and and how few people truly understand we are on a cliff you know how how uh, how crazy this uh, is already unfolding and how little time there is left you know to really uh, uh put some roots into the ground and and uh, work with nature to uh, mitigate you know, some of the worst impacts here. What's missing is the link, you know, to make this understandable in the context of what what can I do about it or what do I need to know about it, right? Because when you are thinking about public policy, even to the point of who you vote for or um, who you are listening to, you need to have a baseline knowledge of what is happening, right? And so uh, there, there are some some really simple contexts. I mean, for example, I found that one of the most understandable um, uh, factoids, you know, is that soil health when it's healthy holds water. So for every one percent of organic carbon you add to the soil, it can hold twenty thousand gallons of water per acre. And soil has something from like four to ten plus percent of carbon potential, you know, healthy soil. So you're talking about huge volumes of water. And if you don't, if you dry out the soil with these chemicals, there is a phenomenon called desertification, right, which actually repels uh, rain, repels clouds, and creates uh, uh, some, some catastrophic weather patterns, which we're now observing because we have millions and millions of acres. Uh, that are destroyed already, you know, in the Midwest and, and basically throughout the entire country of California. I mean, there's nothing alive in California. You know, the entire soil, north to south, is dead. It's dirt. And so to, to, to help explain these simple concepts where, where people then look at the food they buy to wanting to know, has this been raised you know, in a regenerative field by a responsible farmer? And, and you know, what retailer can I trust you know, to source responsibly? And so those simple things you know, need to be better understood and disseminated. And I find my own personal effectiveness um, you know, working, working practically uh, with, with groups. I mean, everybody is like super concerned about making money and getting grants and you know, finding revenue models and what have you. And it's so distracting from what you're basically trying to accomplish. Now, I'm in a fortunate position. I don't need to raise money, right? I mean, I've been working for free for like 10 years now since I retired. And uh, and it allows me to you know, float, you know, but it makes people I'm floating with nervous because my motivations are so different. You know? And and uh, I don't really care. They can't, you know, they can't predict who you, who you report to? Yeah, that's one thing, yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and so, and so, uh, um, you know, so the idea of taking Doug's garden world and expound on it, right? So let's say we want to make this happen. What would it take? You know, this is very practical, very uh, uh, hands-on kind of thinking. You know, and so when, when I right now, I mean, I, I posted some stuff. USDA, USDA is right now trying to solicit. Um, marketing teams in communities 
So they have like $56 million set aside to create uh, local and regional uh, partnership teams to set up local food systems. No one understands what that is. I mean, my own hometown here, I checked in with the general manager of the Soil and Water Conservation District. I said, is anybody applying for this? She was surprised. She hadn't heard about it. It's just like incomprehensible. And so even within the agency, you know, the communication process and how the role is out and who all needs to be engaged. This is not what we would have done in a corporate world, right? I mean, if Disney does something like this, holy smokes, you know, we are, we are lining up all the horses, you know, to pull into one direction. And this is just uh, a chaotic mess where uh, the only, and it's it's like getting rolled up again with companies who are, you know, spending millions of dollars with their lobbyists to, you know, pull that ship into a completely different direction. So So that's... I mean, with as little reach as we have and, and, and as little as we can do, you know, if the information can be structured in ways that it's simple to understand, simple concepts, right? Because it really is at the core of very simple stuff. Um, and so you now Gene Bellinger agreed to, uh, to work uh, with me hosting conversations, right? With people coming together and and discussing this, and in the discussions, you know, you 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 um, spark uh, uh, relations, right? That would not happen otherwise. So a funding guy, you know, a hedge fund manager, all of a sudden hears, you know, a farmer speak in ways that, you know, there was no awareness to this. And so simply by saying things, you are changing them, right? The word. Well, bring me putting the word into play. So that's sort of where my thinking is. I'm just, I'm just really tired, you know, in some ways because I've been fighting this for so long. Um, it, it's making progress on some level, but then um, as soon as you start making progress, you see then a really intensive backlash, you know, uh, from from companies and and, and uh, financial interests who don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, so yeah, so this strikes me as maybe you know just uh, just creating an information base because we're talking about AI, right? And can you trust it? You know who who has been feeding this with data? So if we can provide a database where this is it, right? I mean this is how this works, and and here is your role as a consumer, you know, as a as a shopper, you know, as a participant in in a democratic process. Here's what you can do. What you have not the, the personal reach to do. That's sort of where I'm at. Um, thanks, Klaus. A brief thought, um, and this may seem like it's out of left field, but it, it, I mean this to overlay on what you just said. So I follow a guy who does a bunch of YouTube shorts about flexibility, uh, just you know muscular flexibility. And he's just really funny. He's mostly in his kitchen or outdoors doing a bunch of stuff. He's insanely, he's sort of strong and flexible and so forth. And he puts out a bunch of free PDFs, a couple of which I've downloaded, that are, hey, here's four weeks to total hamstring flexibility. And he's got a, a bunch of others. And he's like, these are free. Price is good. Um, but these are little snippets out of his body of work that is very disconnected because they're YouTube shorts. They're, they're amusing. They're a minute long. And each one of them is inspiring. And you're like, oh, I could do that. That's good. But they're not woven into any kind of context at all. They're just like a, a spray of little videos. But then he does these little book things that take one particular thing and line up a bunch of advice, which makes total sense. So at the start of what you were saying, it's like, hey, I get this whole healthy soil thing, but what do I do? There could easily be, given the structure we're talking about, we could spit out books. Of what, what do I do about holding more water on my property? What do I do about increasing soil organic matter and, re and recognizing it? What do I do about earthworms? What do I like? I don't know, but but within your topics, Klaus, I can easily see a bunch of easy to access things which spit out into a PDF are accessible to people who think PDFs, but in fact, those nuggets live online where we're busy making them better and connecting them up to like way, you know, your neighbors who are interested in doing that. So, hey, did you know that there's like a water runoff meetup in your neighborhood? Would you like to join it or something like that? And then I'm, it's dawning on me that we haven't really thought or talked enough about probably what GPT and its ilk, what generative AI means for this project. 
because because in a realm of activities, we could start to auto-generate. There's a, there's a guy I, I put in my brain who's published the most books of any human on earth because he was generating books with software way before GPT in a really simple way. But he's published, I don't know, two. when I noticed him and added him to my brain, he had already published like 200,000 books on to Amazon that you could go buy. Computer generated. Hmm. And it's like, huh. We don't really think of that. We think that a person writes five or six books in a lifetime, and that was a prolific author, or like 20 books in a lifetime. Oh my God, how did they do that? But we got we got software, right? And a whole bunch of topics and a whole bunch of people who want to get make things more accessible, more useful. Sounds great. And 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 Klaus, I've had a couple of really interesting conversations in the last few days about pattern languages and patterns. I think there's a very, very nice pattern language to write, if, no, if, 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 if not to find and then amplify, about water and soil health. There's got to be a really nice pattern language there. And if there isn't one, that would be a very fun project to do and to spit out as a book and to modularize and make use of, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, your topic is, pardon the pun, uh, fertile grounds for a lot of interesting uh, sort of project work that feels like, and, and here in this sense doing or whatever we're going to call it call, we're really interested in sort of those artifacts and the pieces of it, but but it all makes sense to me. And yeah. I don't know if it makes sense to everybody else. It, I mean, it, it makes sense. I think I would need some guidance, uh, you know, in... in uh... Well, I don't know who's going to do that. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that's no, that's so funny. You know, but uh, um, we'll help. Yeah, that's yeah. So because I mean, that, that that's really not my skill set. You know, I mean, I uh, um, I acquired. We got you. Yeah, we got you. No, seriously. I, I, like, if if we can sort of figure this out, and and as we map out a path and start figuring out what the pieces are, then for each piece, like inviting in a few other people who really care about that that aspect, that facet. Uh, and creating stuff, creating stuff, I think that'd be awesome. Pete, has all this like caused any any sparks to fly for you, or yes, no, positive, negative? Well, I'm I'm interested in the project, and you know, I'm certainly interested in in Klaus's uh, book or books. Um, and and actually, Klaus, every time I think about you know a big project like this, organizing information, publishing information. You're one of the people who I say, you know, here's a subject matter expert that we need to do a better job, or Doug, you know, both. Um, uh, um, I think uh, so. Let me switch topics a little, or let me let me switch gears a little bit um, and talk about um, my what I think I can I can bring to the project. And a big chunk of it, well, there's. I forget what I call it, technical editing, technical technical publishing or something like that. Some of the some of the plumbing stuff I'm certainly going to be helping with. Um, another thing that I think um, I would like to help with is um, kind of program management, project management for um, this effort. Um, um, a, a big part of that original email I wrote was just like, you know, let's let's get a small thing done um, rather than never getting anything done. So I think I'm going to keep pushing um, in the meetings I'm in for let's get something done. And it can be a small thing, but if, if we're making progress doing things, that's a, a good thing. So I think I, I can imagine it'll be interesting to see where this call goes. Um, I think we need a couple different kinds of calls, not right away, but um, some calls will be the editorial board, some calls will be um, kind of the editor in chief or the publisher's board. Um, uh, some of them will be prog uh, project management, program management. Um, some of them will be, you know, writing about um, either, either talking about, you know, I've got subject matter I want to write about or this you know, we're meeting to to talk about this particular kind of subject matter. We're we're working on one book. Hey, Doug. Um, so uh, I I don't uh, I don't mean to say that this call ought to be the program management project management call, but 
um, I think as an overall effort, one of the things that we should do is have a bias towards towards output, bias towards product. Um, uh, so I think even in this call, well, so I'd like to, I, I guess I would like to start to see some bootstrapping of um, uh, figuring out what, what needs to be done next and making a list of those things. Um, and then Jerry, I, this was kind of your idea. We, I, we talked about this maybe last week in, in the sense doing call. Um, uh, let's pick a two or three book, uh, two or three, you know, I, I forget what you, I, I was thinking much smaller than you, I think. Um, let's pick a 10 page book, uh, two or three chapters or whatever, and just freaking get the thing done. Um, and in the process of doing stuff, we'll flesh out um, the, some process that we know about and we'll illuminate process that we need to um, need to work on. So, so in this call, I would, I would love it if we at least came out of, uh, you know, next, next step. I, I would love it if we came out with a list of next steps. And, um, and maybe again, well, actually, that's good enough. Um, uh, a stretch goal would be uh, to have uh, better arrangement of our home on the OGM wiki. Um, so we can tell people, you know, here's, here's the page to start with, and, and you'll see from there how to read about what we're doing and um, where we're going. I couldn't, I couldn't calm my brain over the weekend long enough to actually do that because I wanted to make it better just to show here, and it's still kind of messy. So, uh, but so that's, that's, that's me. Um, cool. And I, just to add to what you said, I think that, that we may want to sort of germinate um uh what a, what one the one book project might look like and then that and whoever's in and basically pitch that to all of OGM and whoever wants to show up for that we can set up as a separate call for actually the the creation of the shortest for the first pass the shortest possible book on the subject um and then and then for pass number two okay great you know lather rinse repeat make it longer make it bigger better whatever but um, that'd be great. But I think that the writing teams will have their own calls, as I think you were just pointing to. That this this will be the, the editorial meta structure ops call here. And Doug, uh, you and Klaus are kind of our two model citizens for when we think about people who have bodies of work that would be really interesting to turn into uh, neo books or or whatever it is we're talking about here, and, and you've already got a book that's available on Amazon. So, I, I, and I don't know how, whether or how much you're interested in kind of deconstructing it uh, on the web, so that it might be reusable or roll upable or something like that. Um, uh, huh. Well, I'm I'm very interested. Uh, it, it's interesting and also kind of fun to think about how to do it. And my problem at the moment is I'm getting ready to go to Montenegro. And so time pressures are pretty intense. But I do have some. And if the project makes sense, I would be delighted to participate. Montenegro sounds like a, a country invented for a 1010 novel, but it's still it's a real place. But it, 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 Barely. It's one, it's one. It's one of those names. I'm like, oh yes, Montenegro. That's where the the diva sings when the magpie steals her jewels or something. Yep. The way you get the if you draw a line from Rome due east across the Adriatic, and hit the east coast of the Adriatic, that's where Montenegro is. That sounds and it's kind of in the crosshairs of a lot of forces, which is why I kind of picked it. Cool. And you, uh, can you tell us why you're going? Why I'm going? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, to experience what the heck is actually happening to real people under climate change. It's going to be very hot. Uh, food is going to be threatened, I think. Prices are going to be going up. What's the local conversation like? So I'm going to uh, just wander around in the coffee shops and pick up what I can. Awesome. Hmm. Will you, uh, are you airbnb it or what do you, what's your? Uh, my son, who is an art dealer, is joining me. 
Oh. And he has rented a house that we get as of May 1st uh, that's actually right on the water. That so sounds terrible. Cool. Walk out the front door and go swimming. That sounds just awful. Yeah. <laughs> We will have to live vicariously through your adventures. Please share some photos or something like that. Well, some text for sure. Cool. Uh, so, but the idea of kind of deconstructing Garden World into its components and seeing where they are now, uh, you know, I'm increasingly taking the view that even if you go with a very high tech scenario, people have to eat and live somewhere and Garden World is still relevant across scenarios it's interesting i had a call with cory doctorow who i really like and who's thinking i really admire and my question to him kind of was gosh you have such good critiques of everything if someone made you god tomorrow what things would you pick up as plans for the new infrastructure for how we build society for how this for how that and i we didn't get that far into that Part of the conversation but i'm i'm extremely interested in, in what that would look like um you know what governance model do you think of the ones you've seen would actually work uh how would we build value how would we build a shared memory of what we know which he, which are aspects of his novels right his science fiction books explore all these all these topics so well, I think most people are hamstrung by the idea they want to get from where we are to a better place in a straight line without going through problems. And my view is we've got to fall apart a little bit before we can put it together. And we don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, I'm really taken with Polybius's view from Rome that uh, the, pol the, the problems we face should determine the kind of politics we have. So that democracy is good when you have internal struggles because you get the voices. But if the problem is external, you need group, group unity to deal with it. And you're going to move to a more authoritarian structure. I think that's where we're going to go. And it's going to be really messy. Is this the, his view, his sequence of anacyclosis? Monarchy, yes. tyranny, aristocracy, oligarchy, democracy, oclocracy? Exactly. And I don't even remember what oclocracy is. I don't either. You can look it up. This is one of those cyclical theories of history. This is from his 40 volume histories. Oh, oclocracy is mob. That doesn't sound good. No. And uh, as I wrote on my blog a few days ago, you know, maybe what we've, we're have we going to fail. And everybody is so depressed about that. Mm -hmm. But an alternative view is it's been a great run. We should celebrate that it's been a great party. And like all good parties, it comes to an end. So we should just go to the restaurant at the end of the world and in, at the end of the universe and enjoy the view? Uh, well, we could be more active than that. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't sound like you're saying that. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of human interaction, music, poetry. Uh, let's... I mean, I'm being a little tongue in cheek with that, but I think that our tendency to see change as, as uh, terrible and the potential solution to be something which is permanent forever is a mistaking st strategy. Mm -hmm. Things are going to change, everything fails. Uh, it's not terrible. But before you joined, we, we had. Uh... Uh, a discussion, and I, I shared some uh, some thoughts about why I am interested you know, in this conversation. And um, my thinking is that uh, Garden World is a great um, destination. You know, it's a it's a destination that's uh, that would uh, bring a lot of of benefits uh, in regard to mitigating and adapting you know, to a new reality. Um, my journey sort of is how do you get to this destination? You know, what pathway do you pick? And I like the Donella Meadows, uh, uh, the leverage points of a system analogy, because it it um, it um, uh, visualizes how you move from narrative to ever increasing levels of 
uh, complexity to actually get into the economy, into parts of the economy that don't necessarily uh, understand the philosophical underpinnings of narrative, but they understand the direction they have to move into. And so the, to, to help people understand where they are at, to help a farmer, uh, a processor, you know, uh, uh, a chef in a in a catering organization help them understand a mother who uh, is on the board of the catering organization in her school you know worrying about uh, healthy meals for their children what do they need to know to move towards that destination um so that's that's the maybe roughly speaking the pathway you know, to to garden world uh story uh, and I think the 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 and to to really consciously break that down by strata. You know, um, what does a policymaker have to know who is not a, a farmer or a food expert? What do they need to know um, in order to make sound policy decisions, even in the community? Right, my city, my little city, Bend, doesn't even have food and agriculture on the list of sustainability issues. Right. And that's the case in most communities in the United States. It's just not on the agenda because it's not understood. No. Yeah. So I'm really, I mean, I'm playing this out a ways ahead of writing a simple book. But um, years ago, I met Zenobia Barlow, who worked at the Center for Eco Literacy in Berkeley, whose main purpose is to get schools to grow their own food and to show you know, schools how to get kids out there making lettuce and beans and whatever and cooking and, and whatnot. And it was really cool. And I'm like, this should just take over the world. Like every school should have a, uh, as much as possible, even if it has to be indoors, like above the gym and the bleachers, they should be growing some crops or something. Um, and I'm very interested. And then uh, one, one, one of my heroes is the brother duo of Hank and John Green, the Vlog Brothers, who invented something called Nerd Fighteria. And I don't know if Nerd Fighteria is still a movement or still a thing, but uh, nerd fighters are not, fighting nerds, they're nerds fighting world suck. And this is one of those teen tween adventure things that is really, really cool where a lot of kids back in the day, and again, I don't know if this is still like burning hot, but it was it was just awesome because young people who wanted to make a difference would become nerd fighters. And they, they had the, they had a, a gang sign. This this was the gang sign for nerd fighteria, which is like be, you know, live long and prosper. And like two of them crossed in front of you. Um, they had a gang sign. It was re all in really good humor, all science-based, et cetera, et cetera. And how do we glue those things together so that it's really fun for kids and families to go hack food in their school without having to go to the school board and the supervisors where battles are being fought over what freaking books can be in the library, but instead where you just kind of peck away at the infrastructure and make things better and, and step step off onto a DIY world where people pick up responsibility and agency and just start doing things. And for me, all our activities are kind of a gateway drug to, uh, to things like that, where, where the sense making leads to going and doing stuff together, like building a plot behind the school, you know, by the football field uh, and making food, for example. Well, let me deconstruct that for a moment because oh, I think, please. I mean, no, Doc, you'll go ahead first. Oh, I wanted to hear the deconstruction. Uh, an element in Garden World is adding aesthetics and putting where we live, where we grow food, so that it's a united environment, which is safe for children, safe for old people, and a pleasant place to live. Uh, I'm very affected by the arts and crafts movement of the 1880s and 1890s, which tried to do a small-scale architecture for a democratic society. And I think that adding the aesthetic element brings in music, art, dance, architecture, uh, which makes it a, a much more challenging and fruitful project. Love that. Yes, please. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, so so let's let's take a school that has, let's say, 2,000 students in it, uh, some are even larger. Um, and, uh, and and so they serve um, a, a regular meals. Typically, each catering, whether it's hospital or college or schools and so on, 
have menus that are rotating every eight weeks, every 12 weeks, so they have set menus in place. So they know pretty much you know, what they're going to, to serve on Thursday, uh, August, whatever, uh, how many meals and how these meals are breaking down into what kids are actually picking off the line or off the menu. So, so the purchasing managers are translating that into forecasts. Um, so that so they know they need you know uh, x uh, thousands of pounds of potatoes and carrots and salads and so on and so on. They also know that they want their salad pre-washed and and their vegetables uh, already processed. Yeah? So when when uh, when when a uh, local nonprofit you know wants to initiate school meals uh, or college meals, and I've actually physically experienced this because I've done. I've, I've had these conversations in the Palouse region and here in Bend, Oregon. So I go to the catering manager of the local hospital system and, and I say, so how are you doing buying local? And she's saying, I'm not. And she goes, these people are totally unreliable. I mean, there's no way I can buy local. I said, well, why not? And she goes, well, there's no planning process in place because a farmer needs to know what to grow, how much of it, and when it needs to be ready for delivery something like six months in advance, at least four months in advance, right? So before a crop goes in the ground, it's typically sold. So there is this, this uh, a brokerage process you know, where um, a supplier uh, typically uh, handles that. Now they work with the clients to establish a demand analysis. Then they go into the supply chain. Now they order from a farmer, they contract with a processor, uh, and then and with a logistic service to deliver on time. So those are the mechanics of providing uh, locally grown foods to, uh, to a larger caterer. On top of it, when you are now working with local farmers, you may need, um, you may need to combine 20, 30 farmers for one order because they don't have the capacity you know, to grow enough of one crop uh, to fulfill this order. So you now need an aggregator in the middle, right? So those are the technical complexities um, which, which, um, uh, which USDA is right now trying to surface, but the way they do it is not really clear uh, to understand. And you can't get these nonprofits to sit still long enough and listen to, to, uh, to a process structure that they need to embrace and follow through. No, so so that's so, sort of a how to. It just simply doesn't exist, and 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 so when you this is just like one example, but but farming is contracting, you know, and 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 it it starts with forecasting, um, and so that's the uh, because the school kitchens don't have the flexibility to deal with this irregular order. So if the farmer comes, and I've experienced this here in Bend. Farmer comes, I have a thousand pounds of potatoes. Can somebody please take it? No, because everybody has already contracted what they need to buy and the orders are coming in. So this guy is wasting a thousand pounds of potatoes because there's no taker because he hasn't gotten, he hasn't made the arrangements up front. So, and it, it is this very technical aspect, you know, of building markets, building local markets where the infrastructure has been demolished over the last you know, 30, 40 years. So what used to be farming co-ops and uh, uh, pork wage services and so on, it just doesn't exist anymore. Thanks, Lars. Uh, Doug, you still have your hand up unless you're jumping back in. Uh, no, but I'll take the opportunity. Please. Um, is anybody besides me worried by the few number of people that are here? It's Easter Monday. I don't know, uh, and we haven't we haven't sort of come back into the group uh, to tell them what's up and what's where. So I'm a little concerned, but not big, not bigly. Okay, Pete, are you? How are you feeling? Um, yeah, I I'm similar. I'm I'm a little. I wouldn't say concerned. I would say disappointed. Um, not that I expect people to have to be here, but yeah. Um, it's a little bit light. Um, uh, I also think that we have to have um, better, you know, better structure, uh, async structure, so that we can say, 
you know, on Friday, we could have sent out a mail saying, by the way, on Monday, we're meeting and here's the things we're working on. Here's the books. Here's the background. So we don't and have I, that yet. And I think that getting our house tidier and having like a, a things to show like, hey, there's a team over here yeah. that's doing this and they're following these steps and here's a description of this project and all that. And I'm I'm and I'm happy to put in the work to do that. I just like my brain wasn't cooperating and doing it this weekend. But I, I, I see that that if we do that and come back into our communities with that, I think we'll get more people. Does that answer your question, Doug? Yeah. I mean, it's, it shows that we have some concern, but it's not overwhelming. Yeah. Don't panic. It's... <laughs> um, I, so usually this call goes until the hour. Uh, as a 90 minute call. Um, I'd like to, to suggest that we maybe take half hour of that and set it aside for making lists of task lists or, or something like that. We could shift right now into some of the doing mode and get some of the stuff done together. That'd be fine with me. Sound good, everybody? Um, Jerry, uh, Um, uh, do you want to share your screen? Should I share mine? Uh, I think we're going to be looking at uh, the wiki and and making a task list, which could be on the wiki. Yeah, um, let me let me actually just share my Obsidian for a sec. Yeah, and we can step to a different way if we want to do it a different way. But and so this is the page that Pete and I were working on, and uh, it, it's messy right now because it's got a whole bunch of things that we brainstormed that are needed. Uh, there are pages now, for example, for roles. So here are the different kinds of roles that we think uh, need to exist. And this is in the language of book publishing, and we might change that. Uh, we might be managing TV channels, or we might be managing an, an ecosystem estuary, or we might be managing communities, who knows. Um, but we have, there's a couple of pages out there. Uh, we took Pete's original proposal and gave it its own page. So here's what he wrote to the OGM list on uh, March 23rd, which has led to our uh, our calls here. And then uh, a piece of the intention here was what do uh, newbies coming into this project see? And then once somebody is in, uh, where do we find what we're doing? Uh, what are we up to? Uh, what do we use for project management? What books are actually underway? Uh, what tools are we using to do this, who is here, uh, and a fact file and things of that nature. So I think, uh, Pete, did you want to add a task list to this or a separate page for tasks? I think you had mentioned right here, uh, we should build a task page for this. Um, Shall I create a new page and then I'll take the dictation from what we all say? Uh, yeah, that sounds good. So shall I just call it tasks page or OGM? Uh, what should I call it? Uh, I think tasks is good. Just tasks? Yeah. I, I have a crazy idea. What's your crazy idea? Um, uh, I, I find it a little bit hard to focus on just um uh just this project when i know there's a bunch of other pages there uh -huh. and stuff um we I could actually open that away. yeah that's another way to do it that's easy out of sight out of mind um yeah that's that's great good enough um cool so um uh, start spitting out tasks. I, I, I have a suggestion for kind of a bootstrap. Um, yeah. Um, right now, it's got two names, and neither one of them is, is appropriate. Uh, so the two names right now are OGM Topics and Sense Doing. Um, I think you need a space in between the brackets, and then Thank probably you. a dash space. Dash in front? Yeah. Like that? Yep. And now it turns into, OK, good. Thanks. Um, so I, I would, would suggest that we want to choose a temporary name even just so that we can uh, get over the, 
the I get over the distracting fact that we've got two names, neither of which is very good. Okay. And Pete, one of your suggestions was to pick a name that is unrelated to the task at hand, just a project name from anywhere, which like Amazon or eBay or yeah, which I'm a, I'm a, I'm okay kind of with, but I, I'd kind of like this to to be sort of a relevant name. But you know, if there's a if there's a name we can give this that would make sense. Uh, so another thing I think uh, is uh, Ryu. This is a probably a multiplex task, but um, uh, reorganizing the wiki pages. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and Stacy, with apologies to you if you don't like this, um, but we could name this project Morley. Morley. Um, and I apologize. I I'm forgetting. His what name's Mar You mean my dog? Asked yes. My <laughs> Is it Marley? It's Marley. Shoot, it's Marley. <laughs> I was close. Sorry about that. One love. <laughs> um, but we could do that, just memorializing him. That would be beautiful. I'm Thank good you. with that. I'm Thank good with you. that. Yay, task done. Come I I would um uh I would actually just call it Marley. Um the yeah. That's good. And I'll go back and rename pages and, and re like that that now factors into reorg the wiki pages because now we can call things Marley this, Marley that, Marley ops, whatever. Um, we can do that. Can you break that top one into two things? Yeah. Uh, choose choose a temporary name and then rename the project. Marley is beautiful, but doesn't it uh, make a burden for the reader to have to understand the definition of a new word? Uh, that's what um, the problem with the temporary name is. We've moved to a. I I I I propose that we've moved to a better place. We had two names previously since doing an OGM topics. Um, neither one had you know any better meaning than Marley. So at least we've condensed to one, and it won't be colliding with anything else in the wiki. Uh, that's true. I, I was going to suggest a neo book or something like that, but. I was going to say, I was going to say placing the stones because I keep hearing, um, you know, people are talking about like the way the waters run and about moving the rocks. And to me, I'm thinking of like placing the stones in order to direct the current, but I don't know what word you might want to use, but that's the picture that I keep getting. There are two stone names that are pretty cool about that. One is weir, which is you can make with stones, which is a basically when you block a river to trap fish it's called a weir and you, you do weirs for other reasons too and then cairns are stacks of stones so when you walk someplace and somebody has stacked a bunch of stones that's called a cairn there's probably other good words too but those would be interesting words um uh i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest another thing um and this is uh go slow to go smooth go smooth to go fast uh smooth is uh slow is smooth smooth is fast um, I had one other. Sorry. Hold on a sec, Stacy. Finish your thought. Uh, Jerry, you should make a, a new page. Uh, future names, potential names. So naming, um, naming project. Yeah. What uh, What do I call it? Uh, project naming. Yeah. And then yeah, right click on that and open. I'll come back. Um, you should have been able to open it in a new. Uh, I think you're right. I just wasn't smart enough to do that at the moment. Uh, so let me pull. Let me give it a different kind of name. What if we call it uh, collapse management? Collapse? Uh, I would yeah. not want to participate in a project I, called collapse management. It's too. I like the idea of it. It's... And so I, I think that should go on the name page too. OK. So copy. I want something that's more visceral. Uh, we're in a time when the, the number, the amount of writing about climate change and related issues is increasing very rapidly. The result is each person has to make more choices as to where to be. And the result of that is each place has fewer people in it. So we have a problem of needing to uh, generate energy around our titles. Correct. 
And Stacy, the, the the first time you said stones, it was rearranging the stones in the stream, right? What was? What was what? I'm sorry. Uh, what was the phrase you you had? Oh, um, something uh, to the effect of placing the stones to direct the current. Just placing the stones, yeah. Prime Minister Xi from China likes to use the phrase crossing the stream on the stones. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm a fan of a one or two word max as opposed to this phrase, but but we you know, calling something long names is not going to help us uh, write about it or attract attention or whatever else, which is why I went to things like weirs or cairns because it's a single word that means something about stones. And I don't know what the word is for a stone crossing across a river. that's it probably has a name in some cultures. That would be interesting to find out. Maybe something as trivial as mapping the future, bringing in some some reference to we're looking at the future. Um, I I own weaving the future. I think weaving the world is a, yeah, a URL, URL I actually own. That was supposed to be a podcast and stalled. Um, uh, channel. Oh. Channels belong here too. This is a hard task because we're really creating our identity, Agreed. which is partly why Pete was suggesting a a, a, a sort of an a, a non relate an unrelated placeholder name. name a placeholder name. That's why is that That's when it's when it's not related, then it's non controversial. Well, so except, I don't know. Except for I'm it's sorry. no. Go ahead, Stacey. I don't know if this is getting too creative and it doesn't work, but I just was thinking of just a, a symbol. You know, I'm thinking of like how Prince changed his name to just that yep. symbol. The project formerly known as. <laughs> well, I, you know, like that. What if we called a studio? Or blank studio, something studio. But studio, I, I like studios. Um, when April and I were in a smaller flat and the only door we had was the door to the bathroom, I installed a full leaf table from Ikea in the bathroom. And we used, I said, I'm going to take this call in the atelier. <laughs> um, and, so, and so that fancied up the fact that I was sitting in the bathroom blurring my background. um and canvas. and pardon canvas canvas and so so i think we are rapidly illustrating pete's advice to go choose something <laughs> temporary because because there are lots of different things we could sort of call this and i think also the richness of what we're doing if we pull it off will emerge as we're doing this thing and we'll suddenly realize that we're referring to it in a particular way that will make sense and the the, the long-term name may actually like grow out of our activities together in the project which i like i i'd also like to just observe that we're we we switched from making a list of things that we need to do to doing a particular thing um, which is cool because we got a lot of, you know, brainstorming activity and it was in the moment and stuff like that. And, and also it's a task switch, which has overhead. Yep. Um, so I, I think you can check off a new temporary name. Yep. And then, uh, project naming is. It's a good page, but it's not a task in this list. It doesn't. It doesn't look like a task. Uh, because I it's, named it the the page name, or what do you mean? Well, um, I the, a task should be completable. Um, it should be actionable, specific. So, it's probably like got a verb and a noun, and maybe a subject object verb. Um, so, a, that there's a task which is rename 
or you know change change the project name to Marley. And maybe it just goes under that top bullet or there, that's fine. So that's in the wiki, um, and we'll maybe also make an announcement. Um, that's the, that's what I mean by put out a call across OGM land. That was my fancy way of saying make an announcement. Well, specifically about a name change. I think also the call across OGM land should include, you know, status update. You know, hey folks, uh, we're going to report in on the OGM topics so since doing thing. We've changed to Project Marley. Um, we have new wiki pages, uh, you know, reminder, we have the Monday meetings. Um, you're welcome to the next Monday meeting. Um, yes, and I think that that should happen when we're done with reorg the wiki pages. And I so, agree. Yes, uh, except, that, except there should be kind of an additional task, which is uh, time. Uh, it's a it's a scheduled task. Uh, so I, on probably on this Friday or Thursday, Friday, um, uh, we should send out a reminder to the list. Uh, you know, reminder. There's a a project Marley call, uh, a project Marley call, um, on Monday. Okay, I made that a repeating. I phrased that as a repeating task. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and then I added find book champions. I don't know the better way to say that. Uh, That's great. And then go ahead. Uh, choose a topic for the first book. Yeah. Yeah. A topic and contributors, or is that a separate task? Um, actually, they're they're interrelated, right? Yeah, I think so. I would make it some one. Cool. What else? Um, uh, in between the the top header and the list, uh, add a line that says "last updated on." And then I guess put today's date. Mm -hmm. Are there other bootstrapping things folks can think of that need to get done? Um, And I think one of the practical questions for Klaus and Doug is, I think of you both as book champions in the frame of Marley here, uh, and that what would you want to see that would help you orient your activities around this? Like, like what resources will you will you need? Because that's what we should create. We should we should sort of serve. We should design wiki pages and other resources in a way that serves you and whoever else shows up wanting to uh, write a book in that way. We may want to start by creating chapters or an index um, that sort of sets topics in place. Yep. I see the process as a simplification of what I wrote, uh, moving it in the direction of, of a, a slideshow, PowerPoint. Uh, and if there were a number of those, then the, di the conversation would be about how they intersect and how to further the whole project. Um, a really fun complexification of this project, and it's probably way too complicated right now, but it's fun and interesting, is could some of these um, artifacts that we create be uh, presentation decks or graphic novels or annotated books? Uh, Stafford Beer uh, published books that had a lot of handwritten commentary and illustration wrapped around printed text back in the day when that was not simple. Uh, so his books were elaborate sort of works, and it's really interesting to see because they were much richer 
but there could be some ways to do that. At this at this point, the simplest thing we're going to do is publish prose uh, in Markdown files that wraps up and spits out as EPUB. But there's all sorts of technology at hand that we might avail ourselves of in the future. I and think I, of, of the book ahead. that we would do as a uh, invitation to a conversation that's online rather than looking at the conversation as an invitation to the books. Um, what's the difference and why does it matter to you? I mean, the, the notion of that, I'm completely on board for. I love that. But what's the difference between the two? It moves from the static to the active. It, that going from the book to the conversation. Right. More alive. Yeah, going yeah. to a book. I think books are dead. Me too. So what I'm saying as part of what is a neo book is uh, books are just souvenirs that are recognized, valuable cultural objects that will attract people to go, oh, I know what a book is. I'd like to read a book. And they are gateway drugs to the conversations and the activities that they are connected to. That's my my hope and, and aspiration here. Well, I see the books as being signposts to a conversation. Yeah. Can you copy that task from the chat, Jay? Uh, the our books dead, or which one? Do you mean yeah. Doug's? Yeah. Got it. Because we need we need that every time we say book, we need yeah. to say. By the way, we don't mean. Yep. Oops. That's interesting. It, it killed the second paren, the second quote. And when I put a quote in, Obsidian wants to do two quotes. Um, it's got a... Is it not recognizing the initial quote? No, it is, actually. If you highlight that whole thing and type one quote, that's no, what it's trying to do for you. Yeah, got it. Hey. Um, half the time it helps and half the time it's frustrating. Yeah. And you can turn it off. It's a feature yeah. that you can turn off. But I really like that you open a paren and it gives you the closed paren, all that, you know, it's smart that way. One of the features I love about about um, Obsidian is that I do I do two left brackets and it shows me all the pages in my namespace. That's awesome. I love that. Hmm. Um, cool. What else do we need? Uh, while we're thinking of that, how about if we assign and put uh, goal dates for at least some of these. OK. Um, so this one would, is you and me, maybe, or just you? I think so. Me? I kind of want to pair program it with anybody, but I, I tried sort of doing it by myself, and I wasn't really getting there. Um, and I think it would be pretty quick for two. But I, do you want to do it, or? Uh, let's do it together. All right. Uh, by when? Uh, Four seventeen. All right. So, so by four seventeen means that we'll, it'll be done. Yes. On or before four sixteen. Uh, if that's well, what you're... Uh, by so, I I chose that date because it's seven days from now. By right. by the meeting on yeah. four seventeen. That's what I, that's what I mean by when by writing by four seventeen, yeah. Um, and and part of reorg the wiki pages is changing project references, so that'll be folded in. Okay, sounds great. Um, so that one should be Jerry um, uh, for on four fourteen, right? And um, for the heck of it, put four fourteen there. Okay. Well, it could be and Fridays, but that's the first Friday coming up. Um, another thing is that. Yep, that'd be awesome. Do you want to do it or fly? Uh, do you want to take the first pass? Yeah, it's better if you take the first pass. All right. 
because you and I still have slight, some some divergence in yeah how we think of this. All right, uh, and I'll do it by the weekend. Unless this is a flex week, no, next week, right? Next week. Yeah. What else? Um, I, I feel like we need more work on. I, I it would be. We need some work on roles. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure what the work is or. But uh, the, the, the special thing is um, to have, have a kind of a shared agreement what they are and how we communicate them and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And I think a part of rationalizing the wiki is doing things like making sure that the roles page makes sense and is coherent with what our, what, what else we're saying. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. This seems like plenty for now. Yeah. Good start. Yeah. Thanks. All right. I will push the page. Uh, Oops, it's not letting me type. That's weird. There we go. Looks like that worked. Cool. Um, we can wrap this call a little bit early, or if there's something else that anybody feels like we should tackle right now for 15 minutes, we can do that. Doc, do you see uh, a pathway towards extending Garden World into a, a application process? Is to, so here is the destination and here is the path towards the destination to, uh, to, ex to extend uh, Garden Well, I think what's going to happen is we're going to get some failures of supply chains, which puts local populations at risk. And they will gather together. And out of that gathering will emerge uh, some sense of what the resources are, what they need, where they might get it. Uh, it's going to be a very messy process. It doesn't have to be. Um, that, that's, that's what USDA is trying to do now, is to be proactive and to connect the supply chain participants, market participants, proactively. Because now is the time to talk about it and even to bring awareness of the process you now into, into being so that when it happens, everybody knows what to run to. That would be preferable, but less probable. Yeah. Doug, do you have any do you have any theory or even like uh, calculus of change in the sense of there are already natural disasters happening in wealthy places, that, like a whole bunch of people. One of the problems is that a lot of poor people are suffering around the world and have been for a very long time. And it's really, really bad. And we don't seem to do very much. We don't, we sort of ignore it. I mean, uh, the, the war in Ukraine is somehow weirdly exceptional because Putin went to war on Ukraine thinking, hey, I did this like twice before and nobody's, nobody did a thing. Obama didn't respond when I took Crimea. Uh, we did nothing. The world just sort of sat there. So they're going to do that again. And guess what? This time, the world was like, oh, no, you're not. This is civilizationally important. We're going to stop you. And he didn't expect that. And oops. And we're seeing all sorts of climate and other kinds of effects happening already everywhere. And I don't know where the tipping point, and I'm not asking you to predict the tipping point, but I'm kind of asking, do you have a model for it? Because it feels like 
a strategic recommendation might be to not help people who are in trouble so that their troubles will be exacerbated because the more we patch and fix things, the longer we delay the moment when everybody goes through the really bad crisis that actually convinces people to begin acting. And there's a very complex inter interplay between mollifying or, or, or patching up the problems and, just, and, and helping people survive these crises, which are awful, and getting us to experience a deep enough crisis that we, in fact, go through the consciousness change that we need to start fixing stuff, if that's even a possibility, which I think you harbor in the back of your mind as a possibility, but I could be wrong. Uh, so I realize that's a really complicated question, but I'm curious about whether you have a model for it uh, and any kind of thresholds, any kind of even a flimsy scaffolding for how this might play out and what to do or not do would help. Uh, I really don't. I've got a lot of thoughts and critiques of proposals as to why they are unlikely. Uh, I think that that the food crisis puts people at deep risk in 48 hours. Um, that's where the difficulty comes. And that's partly why I'm going to uh, Eastern Europe is to uh, see how people are coping with that where I think it's already a problem. Maybe your question was too long, and so I lost the simple answer. <laughs> I'm gonna lie. Well, I think that I think that the way you're framing the dilemma raises a bunch of important questions about public perception of the depth of the problem, which directly affects whether or not people feel like, oh my God, it's time to change now. And the more we patch or ignore the problem, maybe the longer we delay uh, that. Part of the problem is that my thinking tends to be long-term, which doesn't integrate very well. So it seems to me that the crisis, the long-term crisis, is the continuation of too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And with the failures of social systems along the way, we lose the leverage on the technology to be able to sequester CO2. So we're getting ourselves into a trap that we're not capable of handling. But also, isn't CO2 as a key focus for everything everywhere a misleading guideline for what to do? Isn't it like just a... It, it can be both. How do you mean? Well, CO2 has become a, you know, it's a, it's a third rail. Um, so a, a, a more familiar thing to me is masks. Um, you know, uh, wearing N95 masks is still something we could be doing to prevent, you know, hundreds of deaths per week. But, but we can't even talk about masks because it's become a confusing hairball of a subject is, you know, it's just repellent to everybody. It, it, no, actually, it depends so, where you live. Well, um, and who you live with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, CO2 is kind of, the, it, 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 you know, it's like, oh, my God, another CO2 thing. It's, it, it's become a political football. It means many different things. But I think something that Doug said is still true. It's a long-term crisis that needs to be fixed. Um, so even the fact that, I mean, even though it's a hairball, um, and you, as, as that's kind of what I, I telescoped out of your question, it is a hairball. It's a distraction. And it's also something really critical. You know, it's both. It's not... Yeah, and I agree with everything you just said. I what I meant more was that focusing on carbon sequestration oversimplifies the nature and essence of the problems at hand yeah, and totally doesn't fair. actually necessarily fix things. Let's pretend we invented a an energy free way of of trapping carbon from the atmosphere and implemented it immediately. We would probably catalyze a series of new problems and a bunch of other things. And I'm not sure we would fix everything that's broken. Um, Absolutely. The only point I wanted to make is that uh, the movement of events is likely to make it harder to do the sequestration. However, no, the, the, the photosynthesis is basically the one uh, avenue of carbon sequestration that is most readily available. And when you think about photosynthesis, 
the primary driver here is agriculture and, and our food system, whether that's agroforestry or, or uh, agriculture in general. So when you think about, I mean, translating from long range vision to short term immediacy, I mean, during World War II, the United States shifted into uh, victory gardens and produced 40% of its food supply, you know, through backyards. And that happened within, boom, one year. You know, it's because you can get seeds into the ground instantly. And so the, the, there is the, the capacity for a, for a fast response if you know, the, 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 the communication is as intense as it was during World War II during a mobilization. And um, the problem is if we are waiting for the impetus towards a mobilization, it will probably be too late to do much about it. So that's the dilemma that I see. Which is why Greta Thunberg wants us to panic so that we'll act as if there's a war on so that we'll respond in large enough measure for, uh, for the scale of the threat. Sorry, Stacey, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, Klaus said it in better words. I was just going to say, I think that if we focus on the soil and the water and add the creativity and the aesthetics, it brings it into the short term. And there's lots of things lots of people can do within that realm. I agree. My view is that what we the best thing would be to everybody plant everything they can everywhere they can as right. rapidly as possible. And right. it doesn't even matter what, just get something growing in every piece of land. Have you, seen the, have you seen the edible landscape TED, TEDx talk that I point to now and then, Doug? The yeah. Um, for like, if you wanted to create a you know world edible edible worldscape movement, that would be really fun. I'll put a link in the chat. Yeah, we need. Where's the? It, it's actually kind of amazing that nobody's emerging as the leader at a high enough level to have an impact. You'd think at this point it would make their career to do it. Uh, yeah, but so uh, this is a parallel thing happening right now. I, there were a couple of tweets recently because it's tax time right now. Uh, apparently Intuit and the tax prep world doesn't want the government to prepare our taxes, which they could do. Like in Britain, I think the government basically files your taxes because they know how much you made because everything is reported along the way. And you only file if you have an exception with what the government discovered you owed for your tax liability. Um, we have that possibility, but there are extremely strong lobbies, including Intuit, I guess, who don't want that to happen because then their business would go away uh, or some chunk, some good large chunk of their business would go away. Um, that's really interesting to me. That's just a, it's a political mess that causes us all to spend a whole lot of time and money uh, doing stuff we hate doing that we probably don't need to do. And it, I think it's very parallel here. Like, okay, so how do we how do we get over that hump and change the the regs? Um, yeah, we've saved the world. Good, I like that. <laughs> I like it's that. Close. I mean, yeah. we have the the answer, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, here's the answer. <laughs> I better not lose the recording to this call. Um. Cool. That's probably a good moment so, for us. So to... next week's call should be about figuring out how to implement the answer. Yeah. Exactly. And Jerry, I just want to tell you how touched I am. It really that means a lot to me. Really, really. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. That's nice, and I and I like it. It warm, warms my heart too. So. Yes. It's good. Maybe not the implementation, Pete, but the the. The, the path towards implementation. Yeah. You know, the because the the if this was to happen right now, let's say the awareness would happen right now and let's do something, people would run in circles because where do I look? What what you know, how do I do this? You see, and so to anticipate this moment in time and prepare for it, I think it would be would be a good uh, step to take. You know? Yep. I mean, that's the key idea of a garden world. Right. It's very hard to do progressive things if you don't have an image of where you're going. Yep. And I like your idea, Doug, to visualize this, you know, and move it into a PowerPoint frame, where because with one picture you can explain an entire chapter. 
Well, it's like Annie Leonard's story of stuff or Chipotle's uh, thing about farming and all that. There, there are a bunch of talented people have spent some money to do animations or other kinds of storytelling to get these messages across. And sometimes they work. Uh, although I will say that Sir Ken Robinson's uh, criticism, apt criticism of the educational system is the, the most or the second most viewed TED talk in the universe in the known universe and look at how much change that has caused. Almost none, as far as I can tell. I could be wrong, I hope I'm wrong. Anyway, um, let's wrap this call. Thank you very much. I think we have marching orders for a bit here and a nice task list. Th Pete, thank you. Thank you all and uh, more soon. Thank you.